hello good morning everyone i am professor uh, shashank uh, this semester that is the upcoming event semester uh, this uh, department of civil engineering is offering uh, an open elective called as remote sensing and gis uh, with a subject code 21 cv661 so today i just would like to give you an introduction about uh, this course so before going to the content of this course hi 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 i would like to uh, give you an introduction about uh, the remote sensing and gis how it is important to you people and uh, how it is an interdisciplinary field okay uh, coming to the applications of uh, remote sensing and gis uh, here you can see uh, many applications uh, such as google maps google earth zomato ola cab uber cab here maps even facebook and some geotagging uh, android applications are using this technology even in day to day life uh, life you people are using the same applications right so and also uh, many uh, industries are uh, using this uh, concept or uh, technology you can take an example of uh, international organizations such as uh, world bank unep fao and who even private industries such as uh, transportation real estate and insurance sectors uh, are using even government uh, organizations such as uh, ministry of environment local authorities municipalities even provincial agencies for planning parks and transportation people are also uh, using this technology so and some organizations such as uh, ngos even academic institutes are also using this technology so uh, i think all of you are aware about the drone surveying so nowadays uh, drone surveying is very uh, popular because of the advent of uh, uh, latest technologies in the drone so with the help of uh, drone we can get the information very easily we can set the sensors and uh, we can get many information beyond the visible spectrum so that is what you are going to learn in this uh, subject so there are some other applications uh, such as uh, creating the map this remote sensing and gis will help you to present the information in the form of image or in the form of map so it will not be having any uh, language barrier anybody uh, in the world can understand what is going on so whatever the information you have you can represent it with the help of map and uh, you can present it in front of the others and this is also one of the example uh, where you can easily understand uh, the left side and right side orientation of the driving so by, by looking at the color you can understand uh, in india what kind of uh, uh, uh the driving orientation is there in other countries what kind of driving orientation is there so that all uh, you will get to know just by looking at the figure so coming to the uh, curriculum of this uh, open elective the uh, whole subject is divided into five uh, units as usual so the first unit deals with the remote sensing sensors and uh, platforms where uh, you are going to study about uh, the electromagnetic radiations how the electromagnetic sensors are working and what is black body what is atmospheric window and how energy interaction is taking place with the atmosphere as well as earth surface so along with the remote sensing you are going to learn the different platforms uh, which are being in use for remote sensing techniques such as ground based platform space based platform aerial platforms and what are the different sensors available in this uh, sector and coming to the uh, same unit 1 uh, this is uh, just an example of uh, how the energy is interacting with the atmosphere and earth surface and this is an example of uh, uh, different platforms and different sensors uh, available in this sector so coming to the unit 2 in unit 2 you are going to learn about the global positioning system that is popularly known as gps so hope all of you are aware about the gps nowadays every cell phones are having uh, gps sensors right so uh, with the help of gps sensors how we can get the data how uh, the gps is getting the information from the satellite how it is uh, calculating the current location of the user that all you are going to study along with the 
principle of GPS you are going to study the applications of uh, GPS as well as DGPS in civil engineering sector and other sectors also okay. and uh, there is another uh, subject called as aerial photogrammetry nowadays it is very popular uh, because of the drone surveying drone surveying works on the principle of aerial photogrammetry only with the help of aerial photogrammetry we can convert the images into the map okay uh, it is nothing but uh, we can measure the distances on the images so this is an best example uh, how we collect the data from different platforms and how we represent it and how to calculate the distance between the uh, two points coming to the unit 3 in unit 3 you are uh, going to study about the geographical information system it is uh, popularly known as uh, GIS GIS is a computer based system uh, where uh, we collect the data we analyze the data and finally we present the data in the form of map so along with the GIS you are going to study the coordinate system the how uh, the earth is represented and how to convert the curved surface into flat surface and these are the some of the example uh, where we apply uh, GIS principles the GIS is uh, mainly used for uh, merging different kinds of data it may be a vector data it may be a raster data and also here uh, in this unit you are going to study about the different data types which are used uh, which are being used in this uh, uh, geographical information system and uh, the image which is present at the right side represents the coordinate system how we are representing the entire earth so initially we assume earth as a spherical surface some people have uh, assumed it as a spheroid and how to convert the curved surface into flat surface and all these things you are going to study in the unit 3 coming to unit 4 in unit 4 you are going to study about the image interpretation how image interpretation can be done whenever we have a satellite image how to find the different sources how to identify the different land use land cover classes all these things uh, you are going to study over here along with the image interpretation you are going to study integration of remote sensing and GIS so once you understand what is remote sensing and what is GIS uh, later you can integrate both the technologies and you can come up with the uh, user requirement so along with this we have included uh, drone surveying also the fundamentals of drone surveying what are the applications of drone in different uh, sectors that all uh, you are going to study in the unit 4 so these are the some of the examples where we apply uh, image interpretation techniques and uh, here also you can see the another image uh, which uh, uh, where you can see uh, how uh, remote sensing and GIS is integrated coming to the uh, unit 5 in unit 5 uh, you are going to learn about the applications of uh, remote sensing GIS and GPS how uh, remote sensing GIS and GPS is being used in land use land cover classes change direction studies in uh, forest and urban mapping in agriculture sector and for site and uh, suitability analysis even for case studies under uh, water resource engineering and management disaster management and even medical applications also so uh, combinedly it is a multidisciplinary uh, field anybody can use this uh, this uh, remote sensing and gis uh, technology is not limited only up to the civil engineering field anyone can use it even though he is uh, not uh, he is from non engineering background he can use this uh, concept so nowadays uh, most of the applications are based on the uh, remote sensing that too based on the uh, spatial kind of uh, features so these are the some of the example uh, where we can apply uh, remote sensing and GIS technology. So coming to the another advantage of this course. So recently from 2022, uh, GATE has introduced a new subject called as Geomatics Engineering. Uh, even you can also uh, go for this exam. It is all, uh, the Geomatic Engineering is for uh, all, the, all the branches. Anyone can apply for Geomatic Engineering and uh, uh, you can get qualified in the gate uh, because most of the syllabus is almost 80% uh, of the remote sensing and GIS syllabus is similar to the uh, syllabus which is present in the uh, gate geomatic engineering. This is the syllabus where you can see uh, in this course almost 80% is covered. So with the help of this course uh, you can attend 
the gate exam also and even recently i have uh, appeared for the gate exam and there i have uh, got the 75th uh, rank in all over uh, india so uh, it will help you a lot even you can also score easily a uh, good uh, uh, marks in this uh, gate and along with that uh, in git we have a nodal center irs indian institute of remote sensing xros uh, nodal center where you can enroll uh, many free courses and you can get the certificate so there also uh, most of the courses are similar to this remote sensing and gis uh, syllabus so that will also uh, help you a lot so this is all about uh, the remote sensing and gis course so if you are really interested into this course you can opt for this and uh, you can study this course okay thank you good morning all uh, i am professor nitin deshpande from department of civil engineering uh, want to introduce to a subject open elective 2 that is with the course solid waste management course code is 21 cv662 it is open elective course right as you know that uh, nowadays this solid waste is a major uh, concern uh, in the cities you know that uh, garden city of uh, uh, which was called as a bangalore right today it is a garbage city because uh, there are lot of a lot of issues that are being uh, 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 taken into picture for this uh, because there is no site for dumping the generated waste because nearly the population is increasing and the demand is also more uh, the requirement is more and uh, you are seeing that the waste generated is also uh, more and we require large amount of land to store this so here we are going to discuss about how to manage this waste uh, starting from its process from collection disposal process uh, processing right uh, that is uh, by transportation and then uh, the recovery of it how we can recover which are the materials that can be recovered right you can see here uh, that this is how the sanitary uh, landfills uh, will be or the opening dumping yard will be so here we come across the objectives we need to understand how uh, where what is the source for this generation of solid waste which are the different types of waste uh, that are available to us how the solid waste uh, management is uh, uh, taken into picture by its hierarchy uh, which are the various treatment methods that are uh, there uh, to treat this solid waste and also the steps that are involved in site selection for sanitary landfills and how we can uh, reuse that land for different purposes the prerequisite that we require here is just environmental study this is open to all the branch uh, except uh, civil engineering because uh, here uh, you can uh, you can have even a concept of having different uh, uh, like you can make the uh, models and even you can have the sensor system because uh, in solid waste dumping yard we see that the liquid that is generated in the form of leachate uh, will have uh, the content of hydrogen sulfide and methane which may be a recovery gas so we can develop a sensor and uh, different uh, things can be made uh even you can take the projects uh, related to this now coming to the syllabus unit 1 is of 8 hours uh, the total hours given for the subject is 40 and uh, each uh, unit is been categorized into 8 hours so introduction we have what is the definition of solid waste uh, the different types of pollution like land soil and water and the scope and importance of this solid waste management will be uh, taken care and also the hierarchy or the functional element of solid waste management then we need to come to after knowing the basics of the solid waste with the definition will come to the sources classification and characterization so in characterization we will be seeing which categories of waste how to categorize a waste e waste is different hazardous waste is different and municipal solid waste is different and you have problems related to composition of solid waste the problems are only related to moisture content because the moisture content plays an important parameter in generation of that leachate so here you can see uh, an animation of how the solid waste is uh, dumped and also why the soil uh, soil uh, after soil why this soil gets polluted is because of erosion mining plastic household waste and some of the agricultural improper uh, activities that are done in uh, agricultural part also right uh, then unit 2 comes across how collection and transport is done which are the systems of collection how collection equipments are used what is garbage chute what is transfer station baling or compacting that is need to be done how we segregate the waste how the uh, route should be optimized 
right you can see regularly they come to your house and uh, they uh, try to take uh, the waste and after that we go for treatment techniques where we talks about we talk about first separation then the reduction by in terms of size volume and chemical and lastly we are going for some biological process so in unit 3 we are talking about different disposal methods like we have landfill method right we are talking about incineration waste composition then we are talking about uh, biogas generation by using some organic matter we are generating the, uh, some form of gas recoverable gas composting again vermi composting so this vermi composting is quite familiar <coughs> we can go for case studies of sugar industry uh, where vermi composting is the best technique for di uh, disposing that uh, solid waste which is generated in the sugar industry so here you are even going to study what is ocean disposal and uh, uh, one case study related to open disposal and one more method is there that is incineration and uh, pyrolysis which will also be considered so here you can see how the ocean is been dumped with different forms of waste then unit 4 we are talking about sanitary landfills so we have all open dumping there is no presence of sanitary landfills but if you go to the other countries we see that uh, they dump the waste in a proper way so that uh, they uh, take back it and uh, they recover that land for different purposes so here you are going to see the types and collections the methods like trench method rant and pit method how you are going to select a site for uh, uh, sanitary landfills what are the cell designs that you are going to take uh, how leachate collection and control methods can be taken into picture and one of the case study related to landfill sites this is about unit number 4 which is for 8 hours and uh, in the previous case you can see that uh, this is how the landfill site will be uh, the ground water monitoring is also done the methane gas recovery is also done this is how the solid waste is generated and if we have a proper uh, uh, cellular structure for this uh, then we can see that we can avoid a leachate uh, getting contaminated with our ground water but other way we can monitor it and use it for re uh, recovering facilities and lastly when i talk about all this process like collection and transportation treatment disposal we need to know the three r's that are there that is reduce reuse and recycle so the fifth unit is basically on this particular component where how material and energy recovery operations are done in particular industries how plastic waste is managed which is very important as essential commodity right nowadays all are using plastic instead of plastic what can be the alternative things that you can use and uh, to reduce it and also the life cycle uh, assessment and environmental managements will be told to you so you can see the three r's that are considered so these are some of the uh, textbooks and references even nptel courses are there with respect to solid waste management that you can refer we have a manual and we have a uh, code book uh, in place that is handbook of solid waste management 2016 so municipal solid waste guideline of 2016 is taken into account and these are the outcomes so you are going to learn the importance of solid waste the source the process and the method so this is how we need to characterize the waste it may be paper uh, in different color so if you go to other countries this is how it is followed otherwise there will be penalization right here also we are doing it now glass plastic then organic waste metal and lastly e waste e waste is a separate entity which is not been considered in solid waste so lastly i need to end up by saying that we need to go for 3 hours that is reduce reuse and recycle so thank you thank you one and all good morning everyone okay uh, today we are going to introduce with the uh, one of the open elective intro introduced into the database okay it is database management system uh, so what exactly the database is uh, see here uh, when you try to uh, operate on a computer system uh, probably when you st store any data okay that data is been stored in a hard disk right okay so you are not just storing it uh, when you are uh, switching on your system next time that time what happens your data will be preserved in the hard disk so you try to access that data in the future right so uh, so there has to be a file system or there has to be some system in with which you store your data right so that is what i can say as a file system so some of the example of uh, file system are uh, ntfs that is network technology file system or ext that is extended file system so the data is stored in a specific format using these respective file system so when i say the file system uh, basically it is a way of arranging the files in a storage system okay like hard disk so where you are going to organize the files and it is going to help in a relative uh, retrieval of a files when they are required 
so you are not just storing them so in future you are trying to uh, get them as and when you require right so that is what just storing and retrieving back when it is required so uh, when when i say the database management system you are actually uh, working or playing with the data and you are retrieving the specific part of a data for example uh, when you consider one company okay there is a managerial level there is a staff level okay uh, uh, when when it comes to the manager he can have access to any part of a data whereas uh, when it comes to the staff he can access his part of a data so that kind of different view of accessing a data or provision is provided by the database management system so database management system is uh, it's dealing with the uh, access of a data creation of a data or deletion of a data okay those all tasks are then the database management system okay so uh, when i say when you create a directory or folder in a windows system okay how exactly it looks here it is see here so you create a folders they are called as a master file directory within that you create the user files or you may create a directories okay so this is uh, with respect to the windows system okay so when it comes to the retrieval of a data you directly select a specific location maybe if you are trying to access one file which is there in the directory wipe you open that wide file uh, directory and then within that you may have a number of folders and files and you specifically access that specific file so this is what i can say you are trying to access a data which is present in the wide directory so through database management system you are going to write certain queries to access a data okay you are you are doing it manually and there you are writing a certain code okay through with that code you are trying to access that data so, so see here what usually happens the end user is there okay he may access a data through a database management system or he may use certain applications so applications like online and in, uh, encyclopedia or social media website whenever you are using facebook right so that is what what you are exactly doing you are actually accessing the data which is stored by the facebook or there is one uh, 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 big management uh, uh, software like CRM systems for example a company has one website and which has all the data is been managed through that man uh, data, uh, website itself so that in backup you are going to maintain the database okay uh, one more example is email system when you are using a gmail okay obviously it is a database management system that is being implemented in terms of cloud okay so that is also one kind of database application through which you try to have access to the data or maybe you are surfing the Amazon website that is also because of the database because at, uh, at back end you are going to use the database applications and uh, database management system to manage that data. So database management system plays a very important role in uh, everybody's life. So maybe uh, now you have thought uh, like understood what exactly the database is. Uh, there are certain problems. Uh, uh, with the regular file system uh, uh, this one uh, when you're using a, a windows system okay that is what i can say as a file based uh, system and it has certain problems what is that problem first is separation and isolation of the data uh, see uh, uh, it's quite difficult when you are using or uh, using a regular file based system separation and keeping data separation with isolation is quite difficult and probably there is a problem with the duplication of a data okay the same data is duplicated in some other part of a uh, hard disk so that is the second problem and third is uh, text data must be read sequentially which means that if you have thousands of millions of data of items in the final it is going to take long time to process or read that data because if you have huge uh, data okay and accessing specific part of a data is quite difficult over there because as you have a huge number of data processing and searching a specific part of data is quite long next search function takes a lot of time to present that is what i said okay because uh, you have huge uh, number of records searching a specific part of a uh, uh, part of a data is quite difficult it is difficult to access the data which is isolated and stored in a separate data separated files see as as you say <coughs> you have uh, uh, ntfs okay ext uh, and there there are n number of file systems okay for, for example if you are running on a windows system and try to have access to the uh, data which is present in the linux operating system it's quite difficult okay it is not possible to have access to the other part of a data which is uh, resided with other operating system okay so it is difficult to access the data which is isolated and stored in a separated file in the sense the separate file system is being allocated for different type of data <coughs> 
so here the fourth limitation is limits on the number of documents in a folder okay so uh, with respect to ntfs file size maximum disk size is 256 terabytes okay if i say one file uh, that could be resided on the ntfs that is network uh, ntfs file system uh, it is 256 terabyte more than that you cannot have uh, access to the file which has more size than 256 terabyte so maximum size is 256 terabyte and then maximum file size uh, that is what i mentioned maximum number of files on the disk okay these are uh, 4294 967 295 this is the maximum number of files that can be present on the specific disk okay so there is a limitation limitation with the regular approach of file system so hence uh, we have come up with the next version maybe sql mysql or oracle which provides a limitless access of a data or storage of a files okay that's the reason we have learning this database management system okay because windows system have certain limitations whereas when you go for oracle sql mysql no sql <coughs> so there is no such limits okay uh, as and when you uh, supply the backup okay or increase the database size that's it okay you can store that much of data okay so what exactly the database is a database is an organized collection of structured information or data typically stored electronically in a computer system uh, uh, for example if i if i consider the student data it's a database okay student has n number of data uh, types like his name age okay gender uh, the fees paid details okay hostel details academic details are being separated with different uh, tables okay and these tables are collected into one database okay hope you have understood so here uh, in the picture you can uh, see uh, the database is being accessed through database management system maybe by the developer maybe by the user or maybe through the app okay maybe through your website also anyway you are uh, surfing a facebook right so that is uh, actually the dpms comes into picture to have access to the content of actual data okay whereas user using or browsing certain things or maybe user is using certain application or user is trying to find his results and that is being carried out through dbms system itself okay as you are going through a dhi right and you are trying to access the, your result that time it is being handled by your dbms itself okay next is uh, these are the uh, seven real time uh, database example uh, you have n number of types here in the database relational database uh, so uh, when i say the relational database it is managing customer data actually uh, no sql database it is a social media platform data maybe a facebook or uh, twitter and all object oriented database that is example is cat software for a graphic database it is iot systems uh, uh, then spatial databases is navigation applications uh, next document database is CRM systems. Okay, maybe you have certain large content of data that that time you are going to use a CRM system. Time series database is sports analytics. Okay, so these are the different examples of your real time database examples. Next, uh, <clears throat> when I say the database management system, it has uh, so many things that is data definition language. Uh, in short, it is called as a DDL. It's actually the language for describing a data and its relationship in a database. Okay, so what exactly the data, how exactly the data has been uh, uh, accumulated or uh, represented? It is in terms of defined in terms of TDL. Uh, so if you want to modify or add something data into the existing one or you want to change something data with the existing one, then that time you're going to use the data management language that is in short called as GML. Okay, and next is uh, your structured query language or SQL it is the programming language for storing and processing of information in the relational database okay so uh, you are going to learn these SQL DML and DDL in this uh, database management system so these are the basic main fundamental things with respect to database management systems okay so you're going to learn these things one by one uh, in the in this course so what exactly you require in the data database dbms environment is obviously you require hardware uh, so you require a client server architecture and when it comes to the software you require a D dbms okay uh, the operating system the network and applications uh, 
so obviously the network is the base on top of that you are going to have the uh, operating system on a specific system and database management system on the specific operating system and you require application to have access to those kind of database okay uh, then what exam with respect to data you require a schema sub schema tables and attribute because everything is stored here in terms of tables okay when you have a tables and you have a rows and columns so uh, who are the people who uh, uh, like handle this database okay there are database administrator data, uh, database uh, designers okay uh, there may be a programmers or end users okay so these are the people who concerns with the database management system uh, so what what kind of role you play over there there are certain procedures that need to be executed here that is start stop log on log off backup and recovery so these are the things which are being carried out by the database administrator so what are the advantages of using the dbms is uh, concurrency control consistency consistency in the sense even if you uh, n number of users are been using okay the data is consistent okay it is not been uh, it is been modified throughout a system at once itself okay there is no uh, duplication of record okay and then integrity uh, integrity in the sense uh, the data is been maintained properly even though it has been accessed by a number of people security it has been secured with uh, 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 like unauthorized users concurrency control in the sense n number of users can use the same part of a data uh, million times or okay by million people million times at the same time they can use that data that is concurrency control uh, so uh, regularly you take the backup and if if something goes wrong with respect to the backup you go for a recovery okay uh, so data is been uh, maintained throughout the, with respect to the standards and more information you <coughs> get the more information with respect to the files or data what you have okay uh, data sharing is uh, is very easy with respect to the database uh, productivity and accessibility is what uh, it's very easy for one to have access to the data and hence it uh, increases the productivity and maintaining the data through the database system is easier as compared to the traditional database system okay traditional system uh, only the limitations with respect to dbms is complexity its complexity it's uh, quite difficult to manage because you require a uh, lot of hardware and software support uh, uh, as the size is going to be get increased uh, obviously the uh, complexity and cost is going to increase okay uh, there is specific separate cost for handling the software as well as hardware okay uh, performance wise if the size of data is being uh, increasing okay obviously the performance get hits okay because uh, the, the every day the size of data is being getting increased maybe by terabytes right so obviously the performance uh, somewhat get degrades okay so what are the different uh, job opportunities that you get after uh, uh, knowing this course is uh, you can be posted uh, as postgrad sql database application developer or dba okay that is data database administrator or uh, obviously here it uh, they mentions a 2 to 8 years of experience uh, so you can uh, work in some startups initially and then take a experience and then you can move on to uh, very good companies next is application database administrator uh, rdbms stand for relational database management system okay uh, it is some uh, somewhat different from that of dbms okay once you get enrolled to this uh, uh, course you will understand every all each and every basics of uh, dbms uh, next you have uh, application database administrator which the location is bangalore uh, which requires a uh, three to six years of experience and the next is application database administrator uh, in the same field uh, again with the uh, ibm itself okay so these are the different roles that you can play uh, when you learn this data the dbms uh, next is uh, uh, so this course code is 21 cs662 uh, it's open elective okay these are the course objective that you learn uh, you're going to learn the database er modeling that is entity relationship modeling uh, entity is what uh, 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 entity if i say entity uh, is an uh, item what i can say uh, a student a student uh, name and then uh, his details okay they, they that, you, that you can say as an entity uh, so when i say entity it is a student so with respect to that you can draw the diagram uh, in terms of er modeling you can draw the schemas okay and then uh, uh, what you can do is you can write certain uh, queries in terms of relational algebra and then converting that relational algebra uh, uh, 
into the actual SQL queries. Okay, that is what you all learn. So basically, in the introduction part, uh, uh, first chapter, it's going to introduce all what exactly the database is and uh, what is DBMSS. Next, you are going to uh, learn the entity relationship model. Okay, what is entity? What is entity set? Attributes, relationships. Okay, relationship types, weak entity, and all that you are going to learn in the second unit. In the unit three, uh, you are going to learn about relational model and relational algebra. Uh, that's very important chapter. Okay, uh, there are certain uh, uh, selection, projection, uh, this, these are all the content with respect to relational algebra operations and set theory. Okay, so as and when you get in, uh, enrolled into this subject, you will understand in detail. And then in the fourth unit, you are going to design a database with respect to functional dependencies, non-functional dependencies, normal forms. Okay, we have a number of normal forms here. Uh, so you are going to uh, work on these different normal forms. And next in the fifth unit, you are going to actually work on the queries. Okay, there you are going to define certain queries and by usage of queries, you are going to access the content of a data. You can create a database. Okay, and you can modify the contents of a database. You are actually physically, practically, you are going to work on those all kind of things. Okay, you are going to write so many queries and going to work on those data physically. You can feel and you can uh, practically experience how exactly the data uh, is been created and how it is been implemented and how it will be modified. Okay, so basically we are going to follow the Elmer Nawathe fundamentals of database system, uh, fifth edition and onwards. Or even you can refer Raghu Ramakrishna and uh, Johnny's uh, book, okay, which is second edition or onwards. Okay, uh, so this is very uh, interesting subject. Uh, if you show the interest, we can uh, proceed with this subject. Okay, thank you. If you have any queries, uh, you can ask me at any moment. Yes, thank you. So good morning, everyone. So I am sure. Uh, good morning everyone, I am Ishwar Gada V. Patil, so assistant professor from Department of Aeronautical Engineering. So the Department of Aeronautical Engineering is opting the open elective, or sorry, uh, is offering an open elective of air breathing engine and its code is 21AE663. So why we are studying this one or why we are offering this one and how it will be useful for uh, in future as you are taking for the open elective because so it is a rapid advancement there is a rapid advancement in the air transportation when you compare to the aircrafts and in the military sector and in the defense sector so that so the uh, so that the propulsion become the essential part right so that the uh, uh, propulsion become the essential part in the uh, uh, transportation system and so we are learning that propulsion system or the rocket propulsion right so in the macro and the micro levels in the macro levels like a stator blades rotor blades etc and so what are the applications that means we can improve the efficiency we can improve the design stability and we can uh, decrease the pollution form and, and all these things right? after this studying of this air breathing engines and i come to the syllabus so what are the basic course learning objective if you have studied this subject or if you are studying and this air breathing engine so first one you will understand the basic principle of ic engine so what is ic engine so what are the types and what is the engine so how it works and what are the advantage disadvantage and all these things so second objective will be you will get the knowledge of gas turbines and working principle that means what is gas turbine or jet engines so what are the different types how it works so what will be the advantage disadvantage so where we are going to use what is vital condition and all these things you will study in the uh, you will get the course objective and third course objective is about the working principles of the aircraft power plants and the fourth one will be the what is the theory or how it works beyond the <coughs> gas turbine right so what is stator blade what is rotor blade so what is shaft and all these things what are the theories behind that one and what is thrust equation everything you will learn and the fourth uh, sorry fifth course objective will be to acquire the knowledge about various materials in the everything engine so we have studied about the uh, we are uh, sorry i talked about the ic engines engines uh, so what is jet engine what is a uh, uh, ic engines uh, turbo fan turbo jet and all these things we are going to study so and after uh, studying that one so we which are the materials which uh, to be used in a particular propulsive aircraft so for that reason so we have to learn about the materials 
or so uh, how, which are the materials we are using and which are the parts of the engines and all these things so in the model one so you will learn about the ic engine parts the two stroke and four stroke petrol and diesel engines so pv diagrams of the auto cycle and diesel cycle so what are the problems based upon the brake power indicated power horsepower thermal power brake thermal efficiency mechanical efficiency and the specific uh, fuel consumption and the thrust specific fuel consumption etc and in the second model you will study about the gas turbines and the materials which are used in the ic engines right so in the what are the materials used in the ic engines and what are the applications so, so what are smart alloys or what are super alloys what are the composite materials everything you will study in the materials used in the ic engines and in the gas turbine classification the uh, we will study about the working principle operations and how it works and what are the location where to be located and which part to be located where so what is the purpose of each uh, part, uh, parts and all we'll study in the model 2 and in the model 3 so we'll study about the brighton cycle because the brighton cycle is the basic principle of the aircraft power plants or the jet engines so we'll study about the pv and ts diagram the uh, brighton cycle and how the thrust will be produced based upon that one and how we are going to utilize in the advanced engine and so what are the basic principle of the piston engine and the jet engines so what are the different types of uh, piston engines so what is turbo jet turbo prop turbo fan turbo shaft ram jet scram jet pulse jet so and uh, and how we are going to apply in our real time application and all these things we will study in the model 3 and in the model 4 so we will uh, study so after the uh, procedure and how the working principle will be there for the, all the jet engines so we will study about the cooling systems anti icing right so thrust augmentation that means the extra thrust how we can give or more thrust how the we can add the thrust all right and compressor uh, compressor surge and stall so the what are the principle of operations and so what are the engine controls of various types which are uh, having the fedec so fedec will be the fully automated authority digital electronic control engine instrument and what are the power uh, augmentation devices and what are the thrust reversers and the apus and in the model 5 we will study about the same thing i told you about the maintenance and the materials which we are using in the aircraft propulsion so that means was over how we have to check so whatever things we are doing maintenance is very very important whether so as a humans we are we need the maintenance so like that for the engines right so we have to uh, do the maintenance work uh, through the periodical servicing or the engine installation check or by the rigging or the bleeding and performance checks and the conditional <coughs> maintenance check and we have to do the troubleshooting uh, at what time we have to do the troubleshooting for each parts or the overall component and all these things and next one it is about the inspection after maintaining so we have to inspect again otherwise so we don't know how uh, whether that uh, problem has been rectified or not so what i'll do i'll do give the inspection right so uh, in, in the inspection what are the things i'll do uh, or i'll check is so the crack detection and so what are the procedure for to find out or to do the inspections for the particular accessories or to the particular components and parts which is having in the air breathing engines or the air breathing propulsion system and also in the rocket propulsion and also what are the engine preservation and depreservation activities and so the basic textbooks which you have to follow for this uh, subject or the course open elective is uh, the aircraft propulsion by the Bhaskar Rao and the gas turbine by the V Ganeshan right so what are the course outcome so uh, i told you about the course syllabus what is the advantage what is the disadvantage and so what is the application why you are studying all these things so after studying all these things what is the course outcome so it explains the basic principle of the ic engine and it will illustrate the working principle of the gas turbine and so it will describe the working principle of the aircraft power plants and it will compare with the various materials which is used in the air breathing engines and the rocket propulsion and it will demonstrate the service periodical procedure for the aircraft maintenance and also it explains the various systems of the gas turbine engines and so if you have any queries you can ask me and you can uh, reach out to me so i am ishwar gauda v patil so department of aeronautical engineering assistant professor yeah thank you good morning students myself kavita anabretti working as an assistant professor in the department of csc so today we will be dealing with the subject data analytics which is offered as an open elective course 
for the six semester students with the sub with the course code twenty one CS six six four. Uh, it has total of three credits and uh, CIE marks of hundred. Uh, we have divided the uh, total content course as uh, lectures forty hours, tutorials as zero hours because the flipped classroom has been included in the course, and uh, we have SWE exam for hundred marks. So today we will be dealing with this particular course. as what is data analytics so data analytics is a multidisciplinary field that employs a wide range of analysis techniques including math statistics and computer science to draw insights from data sets mainly data analytics deals with the raw data so the collection of data is a big task for the data analytics so once we collect the raw data then we need to filter it analyze it uh, using many of the tools available and then analyzing uh, the raw data is an important task because uh, we cannot take all the uh, collected data which which is in the form of huge uh, collection so we need to analyze it we need to uh, filter it out just to take only the data which is required for us so the process of analyzing the raw data is very important part in the data analytics part so once you collect the data analysis of the data using many of the analyzing techniques have to be included so we will be dealing with many classification techniques clustering techniques other techniques which will be helpful as a tool for analyzing the data and collecting only the required amount of data for the uh, problem definition so here we start with the introduction to data analytics it's a process of storing organizing and analyzing the raw data to answer the queries what we have with respect to the problem definition it makes us to enhance the decision making capa capa capabilities because uh, we have filtered the data and we have collected only the data which is required for our problem definition and then once we make the decision uh, uh, thing we need to improve the operational efficiencies because what we want to operate Uh, we need to decide that is how we are going to model the data we need to decide so there several operational efficiency inefficiencies or the operational tasks are being included in the uh, syllabus then we identify new product and service opportunities the main three things what we have with data analytics is good insight immediate action and information system a good insight or the good site will help you to understand the business context and the information will help you to access the organization storage and information system it will also help you to take some immediate action depending upon the problem definition what we have after the analytics process so this data analytics life cycle goes like this we need to identify the problem once the problem is identified we need to understand what is the objective of this particular problem then what type of data we need to analyze or what type of data we need to collect that is understanding the data then once we take the raw data we need to data uh, we need to go for data cleaning or data transformation as per the requirement then data enhancement is done then even you need to apply the basic important part that is data analytics use some mathematical approach uh, what we are going to have with the syllabus and then finally we need to visualize the data this data analytics life cycle consists of many of the views that is objective understanding the data data cleaning and data transformation all these things each of these circles have uh, are a wide range or it's a big uh, task what we are supposed to work out and in this we have data analytics as a important part where we are going to analyze the data and perform some of the mathematical operations which will help us to arrive at the solution for the given problem definition so working process of data analytics mainly it uh, collects the data from different sources like we have web server logs social media content internet click system data mobile phone records and cloud applications so with these resources we are going to collect the raw data then we use various data analytics tools to, which help you which help us to identify the required data because it is in unstructured format we need to format it as per the requirement of the user then we need to clean the data because there may be certain uh, Uh, dummy data or there may be some unrequired uh, not required data which we, which we, which will uh, further create a problem so we need to clean the data or filter the data and the data analyst can predict the future possibilities and manage the strong bonding as per the requirements the collected data will be stored in the data warehouse or the uh, data collection house where we we are going to configure it in a proper way then we need to manage 
manage the analytical queries or the queries asked by the user or the certain problem definitions which will help us to analyze the data properly. So this process might be lengthy to conduct the higher performance and the data preparation can take time for configure and analyze all the queries what the user request and it takes time with the high performance because of the uh, uh, raw data being converted into a structured format. So data analyst work is to focus on identifying the analytical queries, then data clearing is required. There is a software to improve the errors which are uh, coming around when collection of data and to collect and clear all the data before analyzing them because that may create a problem further uh, uh, after collection of the data. Then data analyst has to focus on data mining tools where we are going for certain clustering classification methods so that uh, they are being filtered out or they are being mined out with respect to the problem definition. Then there will be a lot of tools like forecasting and analyzing the uh, future outcomes. Text mining is also essential to understand the statistical analysis and we have artificial intelligence and data visualization tools uh, to help to visualize the data what we have performed or the analytics part what we have done. So this is the importance of data analytics. It, it mainly deals with increased performance, build relationship with customers, improve efficiency, transactional data, web data and these are the various uh, importance of organizing the data or importance of data analytics. Main components what we are going to study with data analytics are the text analytics, business intelligence, data visualization and data mining. These are some of the use of data analytics. It helps us to improve the decision making. It also mainly deals with the healthcare internet searching, risk management, security aspect, as well as transportation, efficient operations, delivery and data collection. So these are the main uh, uh, usefulness of performing the data analytics or the operations on data. What are the various challenges in data analytics is data accessibility. Uh, say there is a huge dump of data available uh, with the internet or with the other application resources what we have but data accessibility is considered as one of the challenging tasks because while collecting the data we have to be very firm minded that whatever is required we need to collect it. Unwanted or unrequired data should not be taken into account. Then we have data quality and data sources. What type of data, what quality of data we are collecting and from which sources. There are many uh, sources which are not uh, uh, ethical. So we need to just very Verify before collecting the data and data analytics is required to choose the right tools so analyzing of the data is very important and further because every other further process depends on analyzing the data benefits of data analytics you have improved decision making increased efficiency and productivity enhanced customer experience improved risk management and competitive advantage advantage so these are some of the slides what we have done this is just a gist of the syllabus what we are going to have when we go through the syllabus here with the data analytics it has been divided into five modules it has been divided into five modules uh, so here the first module mainly deals with the uh, wholeness of data analytics in business intelligence here we are just studying what is data what is raw data and how we are going to gather the data then in the unit 2 we are just pre-processing the data that is data cleaning is required before we process the analytics part so that is being covered in unit 2 and in unit 3 we are going to have certain data mining techniques like clustering how we are going to mine the data how we are going to model the data as per the requirement of the user is being done with unit 3 with various clustering methods with uh, various uh, association rules and other types of patterns or the recognitions what we are going to have with unit 3 and unit 4 we are going to have the data with the descriptive analytics then we are going to have the various regression techniques classification models and other things and unit 5 mainly deals with the classification methods like how we are trying to improve the data or filter the data using some of these methods also we are going to take these things and try to visualize the data with some of the visualization techniques that i have it is not there as a part of syllabus but it can be taken as a course project for after 
completing the course we are going to have the data visualization techniques being applied for this data analysis uh, part so that we can analyze the data just by viewing the data how we are going to analyze it so in the flipped classroom i have thought of giving the data visualization aspect in a brief way so the important uh, uh, textbooks what we are suppo supposed to work out is uh, we have a soft copy of this textbook that is a general introduction to data analytics by willie 2019 uh, we are trying to get these books in the library but uh, i hope the soft copy uh, you, uh, you can refer also we have the e resources content as nptl and swim uh, which will help you to work out with many of the projects or the quiz or the tasks what we are supposed to have after the completion of the course or in between after your eyes so these are the things what we have planned to cover uh, i hope uh, the, uh, i hope the subjects uh, the subject what is with data analytics is an interesting part which will help you throughout your career and also for the placement thank you thank you one and all good morning everyone the subject about which i am going to discuss today is nano electronics it is an open elective subject and it is based on most of the basic physics chemistry and mathematics that is dealt with at the first year or the second year level this is a three credit subject for which 40 hours have been allocated as the teaching time and the hwe duration is of 3 hours and the hwe is for 50 marks i would like to discuss in detail uh, the syllabus so that we get an idea of how exactly the subject is Uh, being uh, subject passes from one unit to the next before that the main learning objectives we need to know the principles of nano science engineering and carbon nanotubes <coughs> sorry we know that nanotechnology is the buzzword of the day and almost every advancement is taking on the basis of nanotechnology the nano materials as the building blocks so with that in mind we need to understand the effect of particle size of the nano materials on various properties what it basically means is we will be studying at how the different parameters of the uh, of the electronic device they get affected as and when there is a change of the material to do that we need to understand the fabrication techniques of nanoparticles and also the properties that are necessary for various applications for example if you are looking at sensing if you are looking at sensing applications or if you are looking at the use of carbon nanotubes we need to understand the different fabrication technologies that are in use what this means is we need to understand or we need to have a better analysis of the different nano materials and the technologies or the processes that are involved with the preparation of the nano materials characterization becomes an important and undeniable aspect of these nano materials characterization in the sense we will have a mathematical representation which is built up to understand the behavior of these different materials at the nano meter level all of this also means we will be analyzing the process flow and the state of art transistor technology now just to give a brief idea there is a movement not just from the nanometer we are going to sub nanometer level and the talk of the day is we are looking at set that is a single electron transistor wherein each electron itself behaves like a transistor so unit 1 it deals with most of the basics that are already the foundation for which has been laid at either the pu level or even the first year of engineering in the physics and chemistry subjects for example we are looking at the free energy model and the energy band diagrams which will help us understand how the different materials interact to give a particular set of properties now this is again from the aspect of the application say like sensing or the use of carbon nanotubes which were introduced in the clos here on we also going to look at the different types of processes which are involved in the fabrication of these materials what this means is we need to have a better understanding of the bonding which occurs between different atoms and more importantly the chemical reactions which in the chemical reactions that will take place when you have different types of materials interact with each other and also the physical process that 
the material undergoes when different chemicals are interacting. Secondly, when we are looking at unit 2, we are looking at the characterization techniques. Now basically characterization means having a mathematical representation for the different materials which we have looked at in unit 1. Now for example in unit 1, we are looking at the electronic conduction, the periodicity of lateral crystallisis. All of these requires characterization for the bulk technique and the surface diffraction technique. More importantly, we are also having a brief view of the inorganic semiconductor nanostructures. So this means we are looking at the quantum confinement of the semiconductor nanocrystals and the quantum well structures. So here the distribution of the materials will be focused upon from the energy point of view. That is how the energy gets distributed over a particular length or particular dimensions of the devices. This also means aspects like electronic density of states. Electronic density of states basically tells us how the energy of the electrons is distributed over the x, y and z that is a three dimensional structure of the electronic devices. And here the case study becomes the nanostructures. In unit 3, we are looking at the ideal requirement of a semiconductor and more importantly, we are dealing with different fabrication techniques. For example, epitaxial growth, for example, epitaxial growth deals with the interaction of silicon with oxygen. That is when we build up a layer of silicon dioxide to act as either a protective material or also as a medium of uh, dielectric between the conducting materials. This also means different techniques like lithography, etching and strain induced dots will have to be thought of from a deeper application perspective. Now for example lithography basically means how a particular part of the semiconductor device IC is etched out by using different chemicals. For example again hydrogen bromide is one of the uh, many chemicals which is used for lithography and etching. This gradually takes us to the semiconductor nanocrystals. The semiconductor nanocrystals are the ones wherein the different materials interact to form a particular bonding structure. Now the bonding structure is something which we have studied in unit 1 and obviously we need to understand that here there is a sequential flow of the materials like if you are looking at either an isolated atom or if you are looking at atoms which are interacting at different distances. This could be the atoms from the same material or they could be atoms which are in different types of materials that are interacting with each other. So what I would like to emphasize here is that there is a continuity from each unit to the next unit. So the fundamentals which were dealt with in unit 1 and unit 2, they will be emphasized upon through the fabrication techniques of unit 3. Thereon, we move to the different physical processes which are a result of the fabrication techniques that we are studying in unit 3. For example, there is a light emission process, the intraband absorption process the non-linear effects which are an effect the non-linear effect it is a set of effects which occur on account of continuous miniaturization of these devices now these non-linear effects they tend to destabilize or they tend to increase the non-coherence of the signals which are passing through these nano devices so here again characterization of the semiconductor nanostructures plays an important role in understanding the optical and the electrical behavior. Optical behavior in the sense the amount of energy which gets converted from electrical energy to the optical energy and electrical characterization it deals with the distribution of electric field within the semiconductor structure. This brings us to unit 4 where we are looking at carbon nanotubes and applications of the carbon nanotubes. So here again as I was emphasizing earlier we need to understand that each unit becomes a sort of carry forward of whatever is taught of 
or whatever it dealt with in the previous units. As a matter of case study, we are looking at the fabrication of carbon nanotubes in unit 4. In unit 5, we are dealing with specific applications. For example, the sensors, the nano sensors, we are looking at electrochemical sensors and also some sensors that are based upon the physical properties. Injection lasers or quantum cascade lasers also have to be thought of and we are looking at the photonic structures. Now this is again photonic structure uh, deals with how we are using the particular nanostructure for converting the electrical energy into a light energy. So quantum confined stark effect. These principles and the ideas will be used to understand how those energy conversion takes place in the different photonic devices. The textbooks. One textbook which I would like to focus upon is written by Charles Poole and the second one is by Robert Kelsall. These two textbooks are uh, more than sufficient to cover the overall syllabus and that is from unit 1 to unit 5. Good morning everyone. Uh, this is a uh, introduction about the open elective being offered by the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering for the six semester students. The subject name is Requirements Engineering with the subject code 21 EC664. The subject is offered for the six semester students of all the branches and it doesn't require any prerequisite from uh, specific to the Department of ENC. Any graduate student can apply for this and the subject is more towards the management. Equipment engineering is a management related field or rather it's a field related to the project management where it focuses on the systematic approach for understanding the needs of a project, organizing all the needs, catering to the uh, all the stakeholders and documenting the requirements of a product. So here we are talking about the surveys, we are talking about the feedbacks, we are talking about the inputs from the stakeholders like clients and the management of an industry and we are talking about the technological involvement in this. So we are talking here about gathering the information, we are talking about verifying the correctness of the information, we are talking about proper communication between different stakeholders and we are talking about the feasibility of developing a new product based on the requirements of the client as well as based on the requirements of the industry uh, management. The subject is focusing on understanding the systematic way of gathering the requirements and it's about redesigning the product. It's more about uh, producing a, a fruitful product and more about uh, reducing the number of cycles a product takes place before being launched as a final one. So we are studying here mainly the hierarchy of requirements, how the requirements go in an industry, requirements elicitation that is gathering the information, the models used in requirements engineering, requirements once they are gathered, how do we analysis, uh, how do we conduct the analysis of those, then how do we document them for different purposes and make them to reach out the different people in required time. And then finally, we are talking about how to validate the requirements and write a validation report. So here uh, the competencies which we are focusing to be enhanced after undergoing this subject will be, the students will understand how to comprehend how to find out the usefulness of the data collected, how to read the comprehension, how to do the critical thinking, how to do the analysis of the data gathered, how to communicate between various parties and to finalize the design of a particular product. The workplace competencies addresses uh, interpersonal and team management skills. Uh, the subject is not towards uh, reading a textbook and writing the answers. It's more towards uh, case studies. It's more towards building small models. It's more towards alpha design, beta design and modification. The applicable industry sectors and domains include the IT sector, manufacturing sector, product development section and freelancing. The job opportunities which the student get after this will be uh, the engineering industries where they focus the students, uh, the candidates who can be up to the manager levels 
like Bosch, Continental, Herman and Alstom are a few companies which are focusing on the managerial skills of the students as well. They want to see the students or the candidates as the product managers and how do they think before developing a particular product in real time. The job roles include requirement engineers, project managers and business analysts. The syllabus uh, is divided into five units. The units are like this. First unit talks about the introduction to requirements engineering. Why is it required? The hierarchical model. Second unit talks about requirements elicitation. That is the different types of uh, requirement gathering methods, their advantages, disadvantages and case studies. Third is about the models used in requirement engineering. Fourth talks about requirements analysis and documentation. And fifth talks about requirements validation. So the theoretical content is more here. We don't have any analytical uh, study over here. The subject is more oriented towards case studies, towards writing the reports, towards drafting the conclusions, towards uh, making our own decision to, uh, the, to decide about the protocol and procedure about the product development. So this is a subject more uh, focusing on the lateral thinking and critical thinking rather than the technical skills. But it is an added advantage to have this subject as an elective before uh, outgoing uh, as an engineering graduate. This is an essential skill before undertaking the project for the final year. So that before taking up a project, the student can understand what are the requirements of a project, how to gather them, how to analyze the requirements and how to uh, validate a particular project after developing it. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Rahul Suryavashi. Uh, I am working as an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Electronics Engineering. Uh, today we are going to discuss about the, uh, I am going to give you an overview. Today I am going to give you an overview of the subject, uh, fuzzy logic. Now, when we are talking about fuzzy logic, the first major question is what is fuzzy logic? Now, when, uh, the basically fuzzy logic is, a, uh, this is a logical subject which deals with the problems which has a large amount of ambiguity and uncertainty. Uh, basically, when we are talking about any kind of uh, a thing wherein this is basically a logical subject wherein we are working on the logic behind the entire uh, uh, the entire program or the entire problem part this subject deals with the degree of truth which is there in that thing for example when we are talking about uh, the water so the basic question what we can ask here is is the water cold so the answer can be yes or no huh. so that is what we call it as a conventional system wherein we can see that there is an answer either as a one or zero so this is a classical system which works on either yes or no there is a step signal so zero or one but practically when we are talking about uh, a human based system when the question is asked as is it cold it can the answers can vary between yes it is cold no it is not cold or it is slightly cold very much cold extremely cold so when we talk about the values the value should be ranging from zero to one not zero or one so this is the concept wherein the fuzzy logic comes into picture fuzzy logic works on the degree of truth in the entire system so either it can be 100 percent true or it can be zero percent true now another example what we can take is uh, the traditional systems whichever we are talking either there is an answer is yes or no or what we can say true or false so true is one false is zero but whereas the fuzzy logic work on the concept of uh, intermediate values that is a ramp signal so either works it works between the values from zero to one now when we are talking about which uh, about the fuzzy logic in a more deeper way here we are going to learn the concept of uh, uh, basically we are going to learn the concept wherein uh, there is a degree of truth for example when we are talking about uh, washing machine there can be uh, designing a washing machine let us say and controller is being used to design the washing machine so here the system is very much complex uh, fuzzy logic is used for the systems wherein the complexity is very high for example wherein we do not have equations to get the answer wherein we do not have any kind of formulas or set of uh, parameters wherein we can get the output so if such kind of system is there and still we want to get the output we want to use fuzzy logic uh, there are few examples wherein we can see that where the fuzzy logic is used for example we are talking about an example of washing 
machine the output for the washing machine is clean clothes now for getting the clean clothes we do not have any kind of equations now the input to the system is a weight of the cloth uh, type of the cloth uh, then we can have uh, dirt level uh, there are different n number of uh, inputs which can be there so from these inputs our required output is to get the clean clothes so when we are talking about such kind of system it has it does not have any kind of equations nor it is having any kind of uh, set of methods to solve so when we are talking about such kind of system and still we want to get the output then we have to go ahead with fuzzy logic so fuzzy logic deals in it is a logical subject which works on the logic for the getting the output so this is used for a more complex system now when we are talking about the application area of fuzzy logic fuzzy logic is used in every industry uh, whether it is a technical non-technical system it can be used because it is a logical subject so when we are talking about aerospace industry uh, to control the altitude of a spacecraft shuttles uh, for the landing control for the aeroplanes and all those things uh, we can use fuzzy logic uh, in the electronic industry we are using it for majority are using it for designing washing machine or some kind of controllers are being used to design uh, for example uh, a system which is required of feed feedback controlling and all those things there we are using fuzzy logic uh, then in top in terms of electrical industry switch gear power system power system is largely largely uh, is the area wherein we are using fuzzy logic on very extensive basis uh, then there is an automotive industry for controlling the speed, controlling the traffic, uh, everything. There are many other applications where in, uh, the, in the automotive industry where fuzzy logic is used. Uh, apart from these technical what we are talking, there is a man in the managerial section also. Uh, if you want to have a decision making system, uh, then uh, evaluation system for some companies, businesses, for a product, whether the product will be launched in, how will be the review of the product and all such kind of these things are there wherein there are no set of equations to get the output we are using fuzzy logic so it can be used in the management sectors also chemical industry for controlling the ph drying uh, then chemical distillation process etc and the major part is artificial intelligence it can be used in natural language process nlp and uh, various intense application so uh, another uh, example which i can give you in the present era where the fuzzy logic is used is object detection now uh, why we are using object detection because uh, when there is there are two vehicles suppose there is a you know we are designing a system wherein we want to avoid the collision of the car so what it has to do is it will take sense the uh, actual what is the distance between the two cars and all those things and then it can take the decision but there are certain cases wherein the responses has to be very quick so for such kind of applications also uh, in adas fuzzy logic is widely used uh, now when we are talking about the uh, where this is used ABB is actually using it for uh, uh, various uh, in their various cement industry plant for optimizing the cement uh, basically they are using this for uh, uh, the uh, the mixture of their chemical compositions in the cement industries to get the best processes or best uh, quality material out of it. Uh, then uh, there is uh, uh, Samson as well as uh, uh, IFB is also using fuzzy logic in their washing machines. Uh, this is widely used in uh, this electronic industry. Uh, LG is also using it. We can see that it is a fuzzy logic controlled. Uh, so when we are talking about the job roles for the fuzzy logic, so we can see that there are a lot many companies who are. Uh, uh, seeing that there should be a skill of fuzzy logic uh, in their candidates so there are a lot many op job openings um, majority of the uh, requirements so you can see here there are also various jobs now majority of the places where the fuzzy logic is used is in the R&D section that is a research and development section so Tata Steel is right now is using it for pattern recognition and all those things for uh, uh, finding the deformations in their system so that is what uh, they are using in Tata Steel. So there are a lot many things which are there. Apart from that, we can, as I was telling you, in the research sector, they are using it widely. Uh, so you can see there are a lot many journal papers. There are more than 35,000 papers are actually available uh, using fuzzy logic they have done.
so, okay so this was an overview of the fuzzy logic so there are a lot many things that we can learn in the subject uh, as the subject does not require any uh, any of the prerequisites uh, this can be implemented in any domain any application uh, this is not a coding subject we are basically working on the logical part of the application so how we has to, it has to be implemented so the logic behind that thing is the one which we are going to study in the subject okay thank you everyone hello all hello all this is uh, open elective being offered by the department of electronics and communication engineering for uh, sixth semester so the name of the subject is uh, human computer interaction this is the subject code and it is for six semester students and myself uh, santosh kulkarni i'm faculty in department of electronics and communication engineering klst it so i will be handling this subject outline of my presentation is uh, we'll start with the introduction then the prerequisites of this subject then skills and competencies enhanced after undergoing this subject then applicable industry sectors and domains we'll go through industries offering job opportunities and then we will see the various job roles in the market for students taking up this subject so to begin with this is the syllabus uh, human computer interaction is a subject uh, which deals with the process of uh, designing a website or basically an interface so through interface a human interacts with any computer so we will be studying about the design process the models the implementation evaluation and finally the interactive system applications there are no prerequisites for this subject the skills and competencies uh, you will be learning the basics of human computer interaction here uh, the interactivity interaction styles models of interaction and framework of human computer interaction so there are various uh, styles interaction patterns okay and various models that you will be learning over here you will be studying how software engineering and the design process relate to interactive system design and also understand the design rules to develop an effective design process and a universal design so there are various design rules which are accepted globally universally and uh, by following those design rules we can make our design very effective understand different kinds of software engineering formalisms that can be used to specify the behavior of specific systems and study cognitive models interaction models and cognitive architectures so these are various uh, formalisms there are various formalisms which have been defined and uh, they are used to uh, specify the behavior of specific systems for example atm has got its own uh, application uh, wherein we can uh, do transactions nowadays we can uh, deposit the amount as well as withdraw the amount so in such way we have specific systems designed for specific applications so they require they have their own formalisms they have their own design process so we'll be studying so atm was just an example so in this way we will be designing uh, we will be uh, sorry learning a generalized process of how things are designed then we'll be learning the programming support tools available so this is not a programming subject so this is a totally theoretical subject with uh, concepts uh, having block diagram approach so but we'll be learning uh, programming uh, support tools okay so which are available for implementing interactive systems and improve the abstraction so we'll be studying about how these tools work and also the evaluation techniques uh, which are used uh, uh, for user support and implementation and applications of groupware ubiquitous computing and augmented realities which are applied to interactive systems so how a groupware system is implemented what are the applications and all those things we will be studying over here so applicable industry sectors as you can see almost everywhere almost in all the fields hci is applicable may it be psychology ergonomics and human factors engineering design semiotics and branding ethnography sociology language computer science everywhere hci is used the only thing is we don't uh, gently focus on these concepts prominently 
as users but uh, as designers yes we need this is uh, the integral part and one of the most important parts on which we need to focus uh, the job opportunities uh, you can see so the initial position that you'll be getting is uh, that of uh, UI UX engineer uh, UI stands for uh, user interface and user experience in UI UX so you can focus if you're focusing on these particular uh, job profiles then uh, this subject is the prerequisite for uh, applying and uh, not only applying for jobs but if you wish to have a career if you wish to have uh, an advanced training in UI UX design so this this subject will give you a bird's eye view of what exactly is UI UX and what exactly is uh, human computer interaction job roles you can see uh, product designer or interaction designer user experience researcher UX engineer prototyper and product manager so these are uh, the various uh, job roles that you can expect uh, to appear in your job search list uh, so all together this is a totally theoretical subject uh, for six semester and uh, if you're interested to have uh, a career in ui ux and ui ux doesn't uh, restrict anybody from uh, applying so across across branches uh, anybody can anybody can apply or anybody can learn this particular concept so with this i uh, uh, close my presentation thank you for your patient listening Uh, good morning uh, everybody here i am uh, mr pandoran parmani from is department giving you the details about the subject internet of things we have the subject internet of things which is uh, having uh, five units the first unit is uh, starting from the basics and fundamentals of uh, embedded systems and their applications which is having a different uh, dedicated textbook by some other okay that particular embedded system starts uh, the discussion from the era of the beginning of the internet of things where uh, earlier days there were some micro processors micro controllers and the later micro controllers were custom built and uh, we started using the custom built micro controllers to have uh, to have the task of a dedicated and an application specific uh, uh, job you can say like for example a refrigerator or micro oven or uh, a satellite receiver like that application where used to be there then later the people and the, the italian people think thought that there should be a different domain uh, to have uh, an internet of things like okay then the second two in it and third fourth and fifth in it are having a different textbook having the title of Internet of Things, a hands-on approach, where we will be learning about different uh, sensors, different uh, Internet of Things development boards and uh, actuators and their applications and their circuit diagrams as well as the coding using the Arduino or Raspberry Pi, etc. So let me start from the uh, beginning in the sense of the what are the sequence of uh, the units in the second unit we are learning about internet of things with sensors sensor is as you know very well it is a device which is used to measure a particular natural parameters like uh, temperature water water in the sense humidity or smc that is soil moisture content and uh, temperature then uh, vicinity that is the distance from a particular place and uh, the motion human motion and uh, you can say various parameters various parameters like uh, if you go to the medical field it can measure the dissolved oxygen in the blood like we have a variety of sensors which convert the natural parameter 
say for example water air wind speed temperature humidity uh, blood content blood plasma content then uh, dissolved oxygen everything heartbeat ecg is all these natural parameters into the electrical signals and that is the definition of the sensor okay the physical quantity is converted into its electrical equivalent and electrical equivalent is given to the iot development board iot development board is nothing but a microcontroller which is uh, specifically designed and scaled down and uh, made cost effective easily available worldwide so one of the very popular uh, internet development board is nothing but the arduino arduino is a family having arduino uno mini mega micro and mini are there so these all vary in the uh, with the parameters of uh, uh, number of uh, input output pins number of digital pins number of analog pins number of uh, amount of ram so these are the parameters where this particular way and as well as the form factor form factor is nothing but the size of the uh, microcontroller which is uh, which is going to consume in the manufacture like for example if you want to have a matchbox size of uh, this one uh, the product you can go for arduino mini and if uh, you want to have uh, the size of uh, say for example 4 inches by 3 inches then you can go for arduino uno so because nowadays the miniaturization is in the progress all the devices are made portable miniaturized so that it can be taken away anywhere and a simple power supply battery supplied power supply may be used which is nowadays a requirement so um, i don't know no is having its own uh, family then comes the raspberry pi raspberry pi is belonging to the pi family which is again a microcontroller which is little bit more powerful than the arduino family the raspberry pi it belong, uh, its its family name is pi uh, in the pi family we have raspberry pi banana pi orange pi and mini so this is such a powerful that you can have a single board computer if you attach the peripherals like keyboard mouse the hard disk and the monitor so it will work as a mini computer you can load ubuntu or any other uh, uh, specific operating system in the raspberry pi and start working so this particular raspberry pi is used where uh, the mathematical intensive programming like uh, image processing and other uh, ai applications using a high level language like python or java can be used so, so for such applications the uh, raspberry pi is very useful okay so this is about the raspberry pi and again esp 82 82 86 and uh, mm, node mcu these are many other development boards iot development boards and after the uh, iot development boards the time comes to explain about the actuators actuator will be at the output end and the example for of active actuator is nothing but a motor a led a light emitting diode can be a example good example of a small uh, actuator where uh, it is used to show represent indicate the output so a led on may tell that the functionality is going on and led off may tell that functionality is not going on this way actuators examples are led motor latches a solenoid valve or anything for that matter a printer may also be an actuator where the output is taken even screen lcd screen led screen may be an, may be called as an actuator so this is the definition of actuator where the output is represented in this form or that form where it can be utilized for application by the uh, as per the requirement so this is the actuator so this way we have sensor iot board and the actuators which form a block diagram of an iot system okay this way let's next moving to the uh, iot protocols IEEE has devised some protocols uh, which are studied in the second unit. Then uh, we have some uh, blueprints like uh, IoT templates, 
those templates use uh, uh, local uh, devices and they also use the web space and they also use the cloud so this is the way there are uh, many templates to use these templates can be used by the young uh, designers to use for their applications this is the third unit the next unit we are having some uh, uh, cloud based uh, applications for the iot in this cloud based application we uh, use the amazon web service aws and we use some protocols like mqtt then we use the protocols which uh, are very useful in the iot which are using which are considering the low power low power and uh, uh, also the range less range because the iot devices mainly use a small range of course that is not the matter because we have long range devices also up to 5 to 10 kilometers in a lora lora stands for long range applications so this way iot nowadays to end up with and to summarize iot is being a part of uh, every technology every domain of life take from uh, um, medical electronics instrumentation computer science and uh, the business to be to be everywhere the internet of things is finding its application say for example b2b to example is nothing but the big bazaars and big markets where the sensors are very widely used to to have a security as well as to have a inventory control many things okay uh, to end with another point i want to mention that in our department we have a IS, IoT facility where we have a bunch of sensors, IoT development codes as well as the actuators to help the students. The students can use these IoT components, they can borrow it to their homes, they can uh, construct or de design or devise the IoT applications small to bigger applications they can use they can have their own leisurely times at home and you know the person works very beautifully at home compared to the workplace so we are giving them uh, the these particular components to work for work at the home at their convenience and they can come up with the the particular task completed and this particular facility can be used for course projects mini projects hobby projects iot competitions as well as b final year projects thank you thank you one so uh, open elective subject uh, robotics and automation uh, i am representing the creator automation <coughs> solution private limited so in this subject we are covering the robotics laboratory so here uh, we are uh, benefits of having the robotic lab is rising the st structure of the in institution in terms of the facility providing to the students the students feels proud to have the advanced labs in their own institution and doesn't have to look out to others for the same facilities bridges the gap between the industry requirements and the current academic contents the students get the better infrastructure in interact and learn a number of technologies at single place get the proper guidance under the experienced trainer and environment to become future robotic engineer with the hand handful experience on different models and projects a, sing, a single large platform to give exposure to multiple form of engineering like mechanical electronics electrical and computer engineering students get trained on the state of the art robotics and embedded labs benefits to students certified training programs the student get the opportunity to work on the projects on their choice and as per their area of interest in the Custom training programs help them to achieve the skills and create creativity it takes to complete the project. Once the project is done, they are awarded a certificate which helps them move ahead in their life. Innovative program projects execution. Rather than purchasing the ready-made projects from the market, students will now 
engage more to explore the technologies and would be able to create new innovative projects by their own industry types students get the chance to connect with industry executive and can pre <coughs> present their skills and talent to find relative space in company for themselves lab of pro <coughs> layout of robotics lab uh, robot propose for the uh, robotic labs the fano robot the <coughs> teach pendant the kuka robot with the teach pendant so the tal robot teach pendant with the teach pendant uh, syllabus of course unit 1 automation history of automation re <coughs> reasons for automation disadvantages of automation automation system type of automation fixed programmable and flexible automation strategies automated manufacturing system component classifications and overview of manufacturing system flexible manufacturing system type of uh, fms applications and benefits of the fms unit 2 robotics benefits definitions of robotics history of robotics robotics market and the field <coughs> future prospects robot autonomy type of robots robot configuration <coughs> cylindrical scara then um, six axis delta robot robot motion joints work volume work volume robot drive systems precision of movement accuracy uh, repeatability and effector tools and grippers unit 3 content unit three controls and actuators here we are covering basic robot control systems concept and models robot transfer functions block diagram characteristics equations control system and analysis type of controllers on off proportional in <coughs> integral and differential pid pi controllers robot actuation and feedback components position sensors potentiometers resolves encoders velocity sensor actuators pneumatic and hydraulic actuators electrical motors stepper motor servo motors power transmission systems unit 4 is for uh, robot sensors and machine vision systems robot sense sensor in the robots tactical sensors proximity and range sensor used for the sensors in robot machines machine vision system uh, introduction to machine vision the sensing and digitalization function in the machine vision image processing and analysis unit 5 software language in robot program writing and running robot program type of language used activating software writing a simple program saving the program running the program awarding program inserting and deleting the program and robot programming picking pick and place point to point path control and writing practicals unit 1 automation definition of automation is is the use of machine and technology to make process run on their own without manpower is the technology by which process or pro <coughs> procedure is compl complies without human assistance the word automation in the manufacturing sense was coined by ford motor company vice president delmer s Harder in 1948. History of automation. In a newly built factory in 1913, Ford Motor Company introduced the assembly line for car production. Prior to this, single car were built by a number of skilled and unskilled workers in an old factory. So, assembly line can be considered one of the first form of automation in the manufacturing industry. In certain boosted Ford Motor production rates as well as their profit but he was very good to his employees giving them a rate of pay over and above other industries in the area their pay even allowed them to own <coughs> one of the car they produce which was unheard of in the line in the industry 
Ford assembly line and mass production was the first in the world, cutting the car assembly time from one car every 12 hour to car every one and a half hour. Automation principle. A certain caution and <coughs> respect must be observed in applying automation technology. Three approaches are written to deal with the automation. USA principle, 10 strategy for automation and production system, automation migration strategy. USA principle, understand the existing process, simplify the process, automate the process. Second, 10 strategy for the automation and production system. Specialization of the operation, combined operation, simulation of operation, integration of operation, increase flexibility, improve material handling and storage, on-time inspection, process control and optimization, plant operation control, computer integration, integrated manufacturing. Third, automation migration strategy, manual production, automated production, automated integration production. The above strategy allow introduction of new product, automation to introduce gradually, avoid the com commitment a uh, high level automation from start reason for automation reason for automation to increase the labor productivity to reduce the labor cost to improve worker safety to reduce manufacturing lead time more precise and accurate work work is done 24 7 advantages of automation the main advantages of automations are increased through <coughs> throughput or productivity improved quality and increase the predictability of quality, improved uh, robustness, consistency or processes of product, increased consistency of output, reduced direct human labor cost or and expenses, can complete tasks where a high <coughs> degree of accuracy is required, replace human operators in tasks that involves hard physical and monotonous work replace human in tasks done in dangerous environment, performs tasks that are beyond human capability of size, weight, speed, endurance, etc. Reduce operation time and work handling time significantly. Frees up workers to take on <coughs> other roles. Provides higher level job in development, deployment, maintenance and running of the automated processes. Disadvantages of automation. The main disadvantages of automations are less <coughs> versatility by having machines that can perform a certain task limited to flexibility and <coughs> variety of tasks that an employee could do. Possible security threat to increase unpredictable or excessive development cost, high initial cost and displaces worker due to job replacement. Type of automation. Automated product production system can be classified into three basic types. Flexible automation, programmable automation, flexible <coughs> fixed automation, programmable automation, flexible automation. Fixed automation is a fix is a automation refer to use special purpose equipment to automate a fixed sequence of processes or assembly operation it is uh, relatively difficult to <coughs> accommodate changes in the product design this is called hard automation advantages low low unit cost automated material handling high production rate disadvantages high initial investment uh, relatively inflexible in accommodating product changes programmable automation in programmable automation the production equipment is designed with the capability to change the sequence of operation to accommodate different product configurations. The operation sequence is controlled by a program which is set of instructions coded so that they can be read and interrupted by the system. New programs can be repaired, prepared and entered into the equipment to <coughs> produce new products. Advantages flexible to deal with the design variations suitable for the batch production. Disadvantages high investment in general purpose equipment, low production rate that fixed then fixed automation. Flexible automation soft off 
it is called as a software automation flexible automation is an extension of the programmable automation a flexible automation system is a capable of production producing a variety of parts with virtually no time uh, lost for no time lost for the change or for one part style to the next there is no lost production time while programming the system and altering the physical setup advantages uh, continuous production of variety mixture of products flexible to deal with the product design variations disadvantages uh, medium production rate high investment high unit cost relative to fixed automation uh, this is all about the robotics and automation subject thank you Hello. Yes, uh, good afternoon uh, uh, students. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Uttam Deshpande, working as Associate Professor in the Department of uh, Electronics and Communication Engineering, KLSGIT, Belgavi. So, I am uh, going to handle the subject called as Digital Image Processing uh, with the code 21EC663. This is going to be an uh, open letter offered by the Department of ENC. So, today I will be giving an introduction uh, to this particular subject. So when we talk about digital image processing, we are uh, doing something related to the processing of digital images and uh, we are going to perform several operations and then we are going to try to address certain uh, problems. Okay, In this process we are going to develop certain applications. So this is the overall uh, overview of this particular uh, subject. So this particular subject starts with the fundamentals of uh, digital image processing where we try to understand what is the image, what is digital image and um, uh, what do you understand by digital image processing? Then we try to understand what are the different steps that have to be followed uh, to implement this particular operation. And also we try to understand what are different components that are required to build a, a digital image processing system and uh, what are the different re required sensors and other uh, peripherals or other uh, <coughs> interfaces that can be used. So when we talk about digital images, so there are several steps that we basically perform. So there are about 10 to 12 different steps that can be uh, performed in order to uh, try to solve the different applications we can perform several applications so in this particular case so first thing what we do is something called as uh, image enhancement in the spatial domain okay so here uh, we are trying to improve the quality of the image so that we can uh, uh, improve the quality and then we can use it for later operations so that we can achieve the uh, end goal so we'll be performing uh, enhancement in the uh, spatial domain as well as the frequency domain then later we can perform uh, different uh, operations like restoration, compression. Okay, so these are all the uh, required uh, uh, formatting which we need to uh, perform in order to achieve a particular task. So in the in the process of image restoration, let us say you have got uh, your childhood photographs; they have got uh, uh, distorted or damaged. Now there is no other way we can uh, what you can say uh, bring it back to its original state. So only option that is left is we need to use some digital image processing tools in order to correct the defects. So in this particular application, uh, image processing tools will help us to recorrect or uh, retrieve the original images. Then also we can perform several morphological operations and color image processing to further uh, attain certain um, or try to achieve certain uh, goals and uh, reach or uh, develop certain applications. Okay, so when we talk about uh, digital image, uh, uh, so we basically say that it is basically a representation of uh, uh, image into uh, two dimensional form. In X5 form, and in this process, we uh, basically uh, digitize and sample the image in order to call or form something called as pixels. So these pixels will be the uh, uh, important uh, elements to form the image. So it basically begins with this pixel operation, and from there we basically go on performing different uh, image processing operations in order to achieve certain tasks to uh, uh, build certain applications. So there are basically two main objectives why we need to learn this particular subject. One is to, okay, so that uh, we improve the quality so that uh, uh, it becomes easier for human to interpret it, interpret the data or to understand the data. Next is uh, in order to optimize the storage, okay, and also store it and transmit it because generally what happens is once we create the digital images, the next challenge is like how we can optimize and store it. So these are the basic uh, two objectives for which we need to learn this particular subject. 
so now when we talk about uh, um, who are the end users or who should be taking up this particular course so what i feel is so this course irrespective of the branch all should learn be it civil engineer or mechanical engineer or even cs and is guys because when you talk about um, uh, computer vision as such so the image process becomes the fundamental for this there is no prerequisite as such so we'll be basically performing some simple mathematical operations and then what we would be doing is we'll be using these operations to implement the applications so hence uh, there is no prerequisite as such that you need to have a, a in depth knowledge of a particular subject so this is going to be interesting subject we'll be starting with basics and then we'll be trying to achieve some important uh, tasks next comes uh, what about civil engineer let us say uh, you people are uh, basically uh, trying to detect certain cracks or defects in the concrete so obviously we need to have images and then you have to enhance it and, and then you have to find identify whether there are any defects in the cracks of the concrete similar to we talk about mechanical engineers you talk about robotic arms okay in the automation process without a camera without a computer vision okay your robot cannot perform the operations there also the digital images have to be there or the knowledge of the digital image has to be there in order to build the applications let us talk about cs guys we want to build certain let us say uh, unmanned robots okay unmanned uh, vehicles in the, in that particular case we need to understand how the uh, vehicle basically processes the real time data okay the video data or the image data so that it uh, guides the vehicles so range uh, when we talk about the um, applications so since this is a visible spectrum in which uh, basic source of energy Uh, will be for example light is the basic source of energy which is required for image formation so when you talk about the uh, image formation okay so this is basically in the visible band but there are uh, sub visible band uh, uh, wavelengths as well for example when you talk about x rays ultraviolet rays or infrared rays or radio waves so the the frequency the wavelength actually varies from gamma rays to the micro waves to radio waves so when you talk about these wavelengths so you find applications in every domain of it be it a medical imaging be it a robotic be it autonomous vehicles okay, be it uh, any other gaming applications so wherever whatever you want to uh, implement so the basic fundamental knowledge of digital image is required hence you take companies like philips ge healthcare okay, wipro so these are the companies they are basically they are into imaging and siemens for example so if you are trying to uh, get into a medical imaging company you need to have the uh fundamental knowledge of this particular digital images okay when you talk about the companies wherein uh, they are developing uh, autonomous vehicles let us say for example tesla or you talk about mercedes or you talk about the bmws continental so these are all automotive companies where they are doing the research into the autonomous uh, driving so obviously this will act like a very important uh, prerequisite okay to learn that particular thing so companies like nvidia and all their uh, the leaders are pioneers in this particular technology so if you want to build anything or you want to work with them or you want to basically use those tools so the fundamental image processing uh, knowledge is required hence these these are going to be uh, the some of the benefits of learning subject wherein you will be able to apply or use and implement in your projects as well as for your uh, uh, seminars or probably for implementing uh, or probably carrying out certain research as well in this aspect so this act like a basic fundamental subject So I think with this brief introduction, um, I would say that uh, this is the best subject wherein, without any uh, you know, prerequisites or in-depth knowledge about images, so you can still uh, uh, basically opt this and basically learn this particular subject. Okay, I think with this introduction, I would like to stop. Okay, uh, we would see in the coming classes. Okay, okay, thank you. All the best.